So today we are looking at R290 refrigerant. We're gonna, and we're going to take a look at properties, some of our components, some service procedures on Mathwork ice machines, uh, avoiding ignition with R290. Uh, and we'll look at a little bit of uh, Indigo Next refrigeration systems that contain R290. Uh, Neo Sotos that contain R290, and then we'll look at our new Crystal Craft USP 0100A refrigeration system on there. So, should take about an hour today, and then this is new too. I'm excited about this. Uh, at the end of this seminar, at the end of this webcast, there'll be a section where you can go to, there'll be a link. Uh, William's going to put it up in the chat box, the link for it, but there'll also be a QR code on the screen at the end where you can go to and there'll be a little short quiz <laughs> on what you've learned today. So one of the things in education is it's good to, it's good to kind of lock in the stuff you learned by making you think about it after you did learn it. So there'll be a pretty simple quiz, about 20 questions afterwards, and when you complete that quiz, We'll email you uh, the webcast completion certificate showing that you've completed it um, to the email that you enter in that quiz. So just be careful whatever email you enter when you start that quiz is the one you're going to get the certification to on that unit. So it'd be kind of nice you get a score back and then you'll get emailed um, your completion of this webcast certificate and um, also you get emailed a complete copy of this uh, course as well. So it's worth it to do that at the end. Uh, so we'll show you that towards the end. So that's new. If you have questions about that, Will is along with me. Thank goodness, my producer. You can ask questions in the Q&A, um, but you don't need to send him. Actually, he doesn't want you to send your email to him this time to get a copy of this presentation. When you complete the quiz at the end, I'm I'm ref I'm reframing from calling it an exam because the exam word just scares people sometimes. When you do that, then you'll automatically get it sent to you with the email you put in there. So no need to send them your email um, address today for that new part. So you can do it on your phone or you can do it on your computer. It actually works really good on the phone too. I've done it, I've tried it a couple of times on the phone. Works really great. Uh, and then you're gonna hit submit when you're done. And that certificate will go right to your email. All right. I'll show you that again towards the end, give you instructions on how to get there after we're done. So, you know, pay attention so you can get those questions right, huh? I want you to get an A. Uh, so R290, why do we why do we have R290 in refrigeration systems? Well, it's a natural refrigerant. So it already exists in the atmosphere. So the government really likes that. You know, over the years we've gone through you know, R22, which had a low ozone depletion rate. And then, you know, the government's not very keen about that. We need a we need a low global warming effect as well nowadays, as well as a low ozone depletion effect. So they're looking, you know, always looking, which is a good thing for natural chemicals that are already in the environment. So if it does get released, we know it's not going to do too much damage. Because in science, it seems like, you know, they don't know what it's going to do in 10 or 20 years. And sometimes it's too late after we find out. Similar volumetric pressures to 502-404A refrigeration effect operates lower pressures than 502-404. When I watch it work, when I watch those charts on it work, uh, to me, it looks like an old, uh, almost like an R12 refrigerant pressure thing type thing. Uh, or a 134A type thing. It doesn't have those high pressures that 404 and 502, but it has similar volumetric refrigeration effects to them. Compatible with most refrigeration materials and lubricants. Uh, a lot of our systems, you probably know this already, but just as a reminder, we use POE uh, oil in a lot of our refrigeration compressors, including R290, which absorbs moisture like crazy. And I was reminded this week that, you know, when you do a when you do a open that system up, you want to keep it to a minimal of opening that time. Yeah, you know, I remember the old days where you'd pull the compressor out of the box and you might pull the little plugs out of it and let it sit there for a while. Hopefully you don't do that anymore. 
and then you you know you you cut the old compressor out and then you put the new one in place and then you brace you want to take those plugs out the last thing you can do on that new compressor if you're installing it and you know you want to have that refrigeration system open up for a minimal time as possible uh, that's just a reminder that's nothing new for you but that is in effect with r290 as well so it's an alternative, it's not a drop-in replacement for commonly used refrigeration systems. Um, low, medium, and high temperature applications. Of course, it has zero ozone depletion and a, a low global warming potential or an LGP, low global warming potential. And of course, there's flammability um, reasons with it. Obviously, it's propane. It doesn't smell, it's odorless, so it's not like the propane you get at Walmart or the Blue Rhino or anything like that. You can't use that in it um, because it doesn't have any additives to it that give it that smell. Uh, so it's much more pure than that. It's refrigerant grade, 99.5% pure propane, and it's odorless. I remember when I was working on Cascade systems and we would use propane in them. Uh, in one of the stages and sometimes, I don't know why this was, sometimes we'd call it medical quality propane. I don't know why where that ever came from, but it basically meant you can't use regular propane that has that smell in it for that refrigeration system. So some properties of R290 here, some boiling points, some nice numbers for you, right? We all love uh, a little bit of statistics here, liquid density points on there for you, for your reference. Uh, the boiling point pressures R290 is similar to that of 22, and it does well in medium, low, and high temperature applications on that refrigerant. Um, not, and remember, not a drop-in, this propane, not a drop-in refrigerant uh, for any systems as well. I, I heard some horror stories uh, when, I, when I look at the forums from HVAC stuff about people replacing R22 in their home systems for, R, for propane, straight propane, never ever do that. The liquid density of R290 allows a system design similar to that of 404. Compressor sizing, evaporator designs, uh, they're very similar uh, with small displacement equipment. Uh, as you can see, a simple layout refrigeration system nothing unusual here no oil separators or anything crazy like that in these systems just a, a straight system just like you'd be used to left one is a txv right one is a cap tube assembly on this unit so some new things to worry about with r290 but maybe that's a bad word to worry about but some new things when working with r290 uh, is it's advisable to use a gas detector on that system. So here's a little example of that gas detector. And uh, it should be turned on for the duration of the work and set at 15% of the LFL, which means lower flammability level. So that might be a new word for you. Uh, at 15% of the LFL, lower flammability level of 2.1%. Uh, review the manufacturer's instructions for the proper use of that LFL lower flammability level <laughs> flammability levels of r290 so you got air you got gas and some people just the the big thing to take away from this is here is some people think it's really easy to ignite propane but it's not you got to have the right mixture to get it to ignite right you got to have the right levels of air uh, and the right mixture of gas in it to get it to be combustible in the uh, so it's, it's not as flammable as you would initially think, you know, um, but it is heavier than air. So that's always a concern, right? If you've got a, a place in a machine where the the vapor can't really escape and there's a leak and it's just going to sit down there and build up in that level like, so it could build up in that unit. Leak detection, soap bubble test old school. Uh, leak detection still is working. Ultrasonic sensors. Um, they still work. HFCs, the system is charged with a trace of uh, refrigerant, chlorinated refrigerant is added. Uh, fluorocarbon leak detectors is used to check joints and components. Fluorine and chlorine leak detectors cannot be used for gas, for combustible gas, gas leak detector. So you're gonna need a, um, you're gonna need a specific combustible gas leak detector. Hopefully, if you're working on HVAC stuff enough, you've got one of those. Otherwise, you're going to need one of those to detect it. All right, so R290, very combustible, uh, the right mixtures. 
zero ODP, ozone depletion, similar to R404A in the equipment design. So there's no like big equipment design changes, right? No, no oil separators or anything like that in there. Um, efficient, medium, low temperature applications. Uh, pressures similar to 22, flammability levels, and we talked also about leak detection. So those are the things we've learned so far for your quiz today, right? And don't an LL, a new one was LRL, right? Uh, on our quiz today. So let's just take a look at some R290 components. R290 compressor relays have internal protector and enclosed to prevent sparking. Let me grab my little pen here. Hang on a second. So this is new. This is this is actually our Indigo uh, Next here. We don't sell this one in the United States. This is um, 50 hertz only at this point on this one. You never know. That could change, though. It could change. So this little box isn't normally here um, on our regular Indigo Next. And this is where the contactor is for the compressor. So it's enclosed to prevent sparks, right? So it's got a little enclosure box down there. Normally you'd see the contactor in this regular control board area right here, you know, in this section, but it's placed below in this enclosed little box on it. So that's important to know. Uh, down here we got a little filter dryer. Most filter dryers, but not all filter dryers, very important there, not all filter dryers used on Regular refrigeration systems are suitable for R290. OEM dryers must be used. So ice machines have specific dryers, and this comes up in my classes when I teach them sometimes. They are different from regular off-the-shelf filter dryers. Because of that harvest cycle, the refrigeration system pushes back on the dryer a little bit. So we actually have a little bit of a stronger dryer than most normal off-the-shelf one single flow rate flow way dryer on there so oem only so you can't just use any old filter dryer uh, on our ice machines or on our r290 systems always use an oem replacement parts on our components obtained from your manufacturer's replacement network uh, and the reason uh, the big reason for this is we test our components extensively in our ice machine to make sure they perform really well. And nowadays, you gotta protect yourself from the liability of something going wrong. So we always want you to use OEM replacement parts. You know, if you've got a part on your truck and it looks exactly the same, but there's no Manitowoc part number on it, we don't want you to use that. We want you to use the OEM Manitowoc part number for liability reasons. Installation guides. Refrigeration charges are always critical, of course, and they should never be overcharged. Our little baby machines, very critical charge machines, and this is the same. It's a really critical charge. You know, you don't want to go over, you don't want to add a little bit extra for safety on the refrigerant when you're charging an ice machine. Uh, and this goes the same for an R290 type ice machine. And, um, it has to comply with ASHRAE. This is for 290. It has to comply with an ASHRAE guard. And I think the big thing I want to point out to you here is, um, you know, most of these most of these warnings are normal that you might be used to, but there's a big one here that we've been looking at a lot. Um, you cannot install R290 containing equipment, not necessarily ice machines, but it's containing equipment uh, in egress locations that means this equipment cannot be installed in corridors or hallways of public buildings so think about hotels and where they put their ice machines in corridors uh and even like even like vending equipment right there's vending refrigeration equipment with r290 in it now as well, as well. Uh, and ashray has stated that you cannot have it in the egress uh, situation of a public building where people, you know, like a like a designated fire exit route, that kind of thing, you know, they don't want it in those kind of areas. So think about that a little bit um, when you're looking at installation. All lockout tagout procedures must be followed when working on this equipment as well as our other equipment too. So a couple of things here. Compressors have a spark proof protection. 
Due to charge limitations, OEM filter dryers must be used because you can, you can get extra refrigerant in a dryer if it's too big. Uh, OEM replacements in all areas and pay attention to the R290 installation guides, most of which are pretty standard, but just remember about that whole corridor thing in a public building, okay? That's different. That is definitely different from that machine. I don't know if they're going to change that or not, but right now that is the standard uh, on R290. So let's look at some service procedures for you. And a lot of this might be obvious to you. And a lot of it might be new. I'm not sure. So R290 ice machines, they don't come with um, gauge ports on them typically. They don't come with gauge ports on them. So if you had to do refrigeration work, you'd have to break into that system. Uh, and one of the things we do here at Manitowoc is we try and avoid you having to do that. So the R290 service diagnostics that I designed uh, are temperature driven. So you can put temperature probes on your system and diagnose compressors and TXVs and things like that. But eventually, if you have a compressor that's failed, you're going to have to break into that refrigeration system, right? So there's, you know, there's different ways of doing this. We're going to use a piercing valve, just like that little A1 up there on top, uh, a piercing valve to break into the system. And most of you guys know, but maybe you don't, maybe if you're new, that you don't leave piercing valves on a system. They're temporary, right? When I used to go to the supply house and buy like, five a1 piercing valves the guys were like oh there's five more leaks <laughs> but no they're not supposed to stay on the system they're temporary and i'm sure you've all gone on service calls and you found them on the system left there uh country and county sorry county country local codes uh for removal r290 should always take precedence over manufacturer suggestions so you know some countries say it's okay just to drag the unit outside and vent it because it's just propane. Some countries say, no, 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 because it's a refrigerant. It's termed, it's got an R290 number on it. You have to recover it because it's because it's deemed a refrigerant. So, you know, local codes would take precedence over what we would have in our guidelines, of course, because uh, this stuff is used uh, pretty internationally. When we're recovering into a cylinder, we're going to use piercing valves on our, syst on our system. And here's some other handy tools that we use. I like, the, I think that's mine. In the one, oh, the one right here, this little clamp on. Uh, I have one of these here. I don't know if Will just pulled it off the internet or, or if we took a picture of mine. But we, we have one where we, you can just clamp it on and pierce into that system. The nice thing about that one is it's reusable. So if you were like recovering a system, you wouldn't have to waste like a, an A1 tap if you were just disposing of a unit. That was really useful for that. So use a piston tool or valve after repairing the system. Access valves will be needed, will be added to properly nitrogen test and pull a vacuum down to 500 microns. So once you got in that system, then you'd have to put some kind of proper access valve on, get it down to 500 microns if you're vacuuming. And then after the unit is recharged, that stub will need to be taken off, right? That charging port will need to be removed on there, uh, which is where it gets tricky on the unit, right? That's where it can start to get tricky because normally on a refrigeration system, you can see I would just pinch it off like this with a clamp. And then I would, you know, if I didn't want to leave anything on and then I would pinch this part off and then I would braze this part close. Now you can't do that on propane because you can't braze on the tube uh, with that flammable refrigerant in it just in case your clamp is not 100% working. We don't want to light anything up. So we might use like a lock ring lock off, which looks like this. Uh, I'll show you that a little bit closer as well uh, to clamp off that tube when we're done. So this is this is one tool. Um, Gosh, this came out of Germany, I think. Yeah, Germany was lock ring. We used to use these a lot in England because uh, we used to have buildings where you couldn't braze, you couldn't use a flame in them. Um, or if you did use a flame, you know, you'd have to stay for two hours just to make sure nothing caught fire and you'd have to have a fire watch. So sometimes when we ran refrigeration lines through buildings, we would use a lock ring tool, 
which is the specialized specialized tool that uses a special fitting and it clamps together and it makes fittings that are stronger or just as strong as brazing the joints together on it. Um, so that's one option you could do without having to braze a joint on there on that refrigeration system. So that's an alternative to brazing. I, I'm pretty sure I haven't checked later, but um, lock ring was the was the only one for a long time. But I'm pretty sure there are other manufacturers coming up with this kind of uh, technology now for R290. Purge the system with an inert gas like dry nitrogen. You know, when when everything's out your system, you would be purging it if you had to do uh, any procedures on that. And purge purge again with inert gas when you're done. This ensures the system is clear of all refrigerant out of there. Evacuate that system. Um, with the, you can see your vac pump here locked up to that system after we've done any repairs, like replacing a compressor. Uh, remove the components of the system using a tube cutter. Never unsweating. Do not unsweat parts in a t in a system. You know, even if you're working on non R two nineties, I see a lot of people unsweat filter dryers. That's not good practice. You should always be cutting a filter dryer out with a tubing cutter not unsweating it because you're just releasing the moisture in that filter dryer back into the system when you make it nice and hot. Uh, be sure the unit is grounded before charging, right? We don't want any static shock or anything like that. So we're going to make sure that this unit is grounded somehow, you know, maybe if it's got a plug on this little unit and you've unplugged the unit, uh, maybe you need to, you know, make sure it is grounded out somehow on that unit. But you'd probably have the plug in by this point. Um, same rules apply for evacuations for regular refrigerant as R290. Too high level of condensables will increase energy consumption and condense the temperature. We don't want anything left in there, of course. Uh, 500 microns uh, is our evacuation level, is our standard evacuation level and refrigeration systems here at Manitowoc Guys. Similar charging with 290 as you would with regular refrigerant. Nothing big, no big deal there. Uh, you could charge it as a liquid to make it a little bit quicker, but you need a really good scale uh, that's very accurate, um, which I'm sure you have. But you know, we're talking, you know, we might be talking five ounces uh, on a refrigeration system now, uh, which is, you know, if you don't have a good scale, a good digital scale. <laughs> Then you can't do it. I laugh because I remember when I was 17 and my service manager, I said, I need a, a scale for to charge. And he gave me like this fish weighing scale, you know, with a spring in it and stuff. I'm like, what am I, I can't, I can't measure five ounces on this thing. It's okay for like 10 pounds, but I can't measure five <laughs> ounces or something. <laughs> so charge to nameplate weight. It's very important not to overfill the system, just like any critical system when you're when you're working with very small amounts of refrigerant, it's very critical to not overcharge the system. Uh, one of the guidelines we use here at Manitowoc Ice is, you know, let's say it's a five ounce system, just for example, um, and you've got your five ounces in and you've weighed it in, and then you know that part of that five ounces is in these hoses, right? So if I just pull the hoses off, which might carry one or two ounces, I could be undercharged. So I'm going to pull that refrigerant out these hoses, right? So I'm going to close my can of refrigerant. I'm going to let my compressor keep running, and I'm going to let it pull down to as low a suction pressure as I can on those hoses uh, to pull it out. Another trick we use sometimes on our really small ice machines is sometimes, let's say it's at like, You've you've shut your gate, you've shut your can off, and you got it down to 10 psi, and you're like, I know I still got 10 psi in those lines or something. Another trick we use sometimes is we unplug the water pump on really small ice machines when they're in a freeze cycle, and that'll bring the suction pressure down even further. It might get you down to like one or two psi sometimes, uh, and then you can take your gauges off, and you're gonna use, you're gonna lose very little amount in your hoses when you're down that far into the you know into a one or two suction pressure scenario try and get that suction pressure down as much as you can without going into a vacuum obviously uh before you can take those gauges off so portable gas detectors need to be used it's advisable uh before brazen on 290 make sure you sweep it out with nitrogen 
Uh, soap bubbles are good leak detesting or, or electronics on there. Um, use liquid for a quicker charge time in the liquid state. Uh, though you could charge it with vapor too. It's not like a, you know, it's it's got a separation or anything like that. Liquid vapor. R290s are typically 40 to 50 percent of flora. So if you've got like a 12 ounce ice machine charge and you and you and it's a a 404A, it might be like it might be like six ounces or five ounces. So a, a much lower use uh, of the materials that we're going to well, use. Well, I got his audio. R290 open pressures compared to that of R22 uh, on those systems. I don't, All right. I don't know how to get it onto the computer. Just, sorry, I heard some people in the background. Just be careful to mute yourself. I can't always mute you nowadays when I'm going through this program. Uh, so just be careful to make sure you mute your microphones as we go through. It's just so it's not just, it's not like I don't want to hear you. <laughs> it's just so it's not distracting to other people. Before repairing the electrical system, we've got to make sure it's grounded and the ground does not break on it to avoid ignition. Make sure those capacitors are discharged, right? Give them some time to discharge on those capacitors. Use caution working on live components and make sure the casings on electrical components are not cracked, obviously, when breaking. So we've got a few, you know, we got a few differences here. You can see, you know, we got some spark points that are covered up when working on R290. They're not, do you, I don't know if you've ever worked on like those explosion proof compressors. Uh, sometimes you find those in scientific labs and stuff that have like the big, the big tubes on the connectors. It's not like that or anything, uh, but we do avoid all sparking uh, in that unit on that machine. So general safety, watch out for confined spaces. Obviously you don't want R290 to, to leak in a confined space. Very small amount of R290 in that, in that unit. Very, very small, five ounces, probably like less than a, less than a lighter uh, of, of propane in there, but still um, manufacturers, it can be more hazardous because you know, they might have a hundred of these R290s lined up in their factory, and if they're all leaking, that would be a problem. Uh, no ignition source should be present anywhere near the work area, so just take a look around. Make sure you know where the fire extinguisher uh, equipment is, just like you would normally when you're brazing. Uh, make sure it's ventilated on the equipment you're working on, and for 290, you should have, you should have a gas detector present to warn workers of concentrations. And only refrigerant handling and other service equipment designed for use of flammable refrigerants should be used when R290 is being used. So sparks, open flames, hot surfaces, right? All of those are going to cause um, ignition problems. So we want to watch out for those, right? We don't want to be... <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. We don't want to be venting R290 refrigerant next to a gas burner in the kitchen, right? That, that's not going to be a good situation or scenario to go through. So just be aware of your surroundings. Maybe you'll have to drag it outside or something like that uh, to work on it. Watch out for hot surfaces. They can ignite as well. Where leaked refrigerant will not be exposed to any surfaces exceeding 840 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the ignition temperature of it. So just be aware when you're working in that kitchen or, you know, wherever it is, maybe... I don't know. I'm trying to think of all the different scenarios. Anywhere where there's a live ignition source on there, just be aware and just take a good look around. Uh, I wouldn't want you to get injured in any way. Fire extinguisher available when servicing R290. 90% and 10% propane is required for ignition on there. So let's take a look at these systems, right? You can see my, this is my Indigo uh, Next ice machine. You can see it's got little warning signs on it here and here. So it's nice and obvious all what we're working on here. Um, this is one of the ones we sell in Europe. We don't sell this machine in the United States currently. Uh, this is a 50 hertz version. Who knows? They might want to they might want to do it one day, but we're not selling them at this point. Left side, you can see the expansion valves. There's nothing unusual there. Right side, we can see our compressor sitting in there and notice right notice this little new box in here for an r290 system that contains the contactor in so it's sealed off in that box it's not just sitting in there with a control board refrigeration system's the same compressor txv hot gas valve 
Uh, receiver, nothing unusual there. Goes into a harvest cycle just the same way as a regular ice machine would. We energize the hot gas harvest valve. Really, that's the only difference in this refrigeration system is energizing that hot gas harvest valve and the refrigerant going into the evaporator. Thermistors, same place. We have our thermistors in the same place as we do on regular ice machines to help you diagnose those units. And R290 refrigerant removal and system processes. Um, if operational 290 ice machines run for at least one making cycle to warm up the compressor I to removing the 290 refrigerant it's not unusual line taps should be added to high and low side process tubes 290 refrigerant must be recovered according to local guidelines if they're overruling our guidelines local guidelines got to be followed so the local guidelines are going to overrule ours if they're like no we're in russia and they say that you have to um you know take it outside 10 feet away from a building to recover it. But and you're like, but Mandis Walk Book says that you can just recover it into a cylinder. You got to follow those local guidelines. Sweep the system with nitrogen as you would normally into the high side line tap and allow it to come out low side line tap to make sure it's all cleared out before any kind of flame <laughs> is lit up on that system. Vacuum pump. So pull, pull a vacuum on the system through both line taps. Uh, to remove any R290 from the compressor oil, getting all that 290 out of it before you light anything up on that system. Remember, you got to use a you got to have a fire extinguisher handy. We're going to have a vacuum pump handy, a CO2 fire extinguisher on that system, uh, and charge the system with R290 through the high sideline tap. Charge correctly within one percent of the nameplate listed. All right, and here is my little um, here's my little uh, pinch off on that unit too. You can see how this is uh, a, a little cap off the unit that doesn't need brazing. It goes on there and claps on there. So there are various tools that do this now. I just showed you one of them today that works for refrigerant R290 in the refrigeration system. I don't know. I'm thinking Richie and Yellow Jacket probably are starting to have one if they don't already. Uh, I don't know because I just used my uh, old school one that I have from England from all those years back. All right, let's take a look at a different machine. Neo, we do make Neo ice machines of R290 in 50 hertz versions only. Maybe they'll change. Uh, we, we did experiment with a 60 hertz one at one point, uh, so it could change in the next year or two. I'm not sure. Uh, but right now they're only 50 hertz. Right now in the United States at least, if we offered a customer the choice of R290 and you know 404A um, and the 290 unit choice was more expensive, they might say like, well, why would I go for this 290? I don't really care that much about it. Um, so there's no mandate that it has to be 290 on that system or anything like that in the United States. Now in Europe, you know, they're trying to eliminate that 404A right now. They're not doing it here in the United States. So, you know, going to 290 on smaller systems um, is sometimes their only choice. Here's a look at a little Neo R290. Biggest difference here, just for interest, you might never, you might never see one, I don't know is we have this extra little box here that contains the contactor um, and all those electrical components that are called sparks. So we have a little extra box on a Neo R290 uh, for that ice machine in there. Uh, following diagnostics must be complete with the use of an accurate surface mount phenomena to achieve refrigeration temperatures. So we have like a, a temperature diagnostic on these 290s because then they're, they're not allowed to have gauge ports left on them so rather than make you go through all the frustration of putting gauge ports on and then brazing <laughs> gauge ports on and then making sure everything's pulled off we developed um temperature diagnostics on these ice machines to make your life a little bit easier 
Make sure the water pattern's good, just like we would on any Manitoba ice machine, and clean it up before you do anything else. And then you can go through these steps of putting clamps on the suction and discharge lines of that Neo ice machine and record system temperatures throughout the cycle. And that'll give you a nice refrigeration diagnostic, which you can find in our uh, R290 uh, undercounter Neo ice machine technician handbook for it. Neos have different evaporator tubing schematics on those. So I'm showing you from the front view. If you could see through it, this is what it would look like uh, on the bigger ones and the little ones uh, on the inlets of the evaporator and the outlets of the evaporator. So uh, kind of on the other side, there's a nice little look through the machine. So you can see exactly where those tubes are coming in and out. Here's my discharge line temperature. Here's my suction line temperature where I'd hook up those clamps to do a temperature diagnostic on that ice machine. I might, during that diagnostic, ask you to take the inlet temperature of the hot gas valve solenoid. And I might ask you to take the liquid line temperature as well, coming out that condenser in the diagnostic chart. And this is kind of what it looks like here in that diagnostic chart. So I give you normal temperatures uh, in the book, and then you go through this and you say what the temperatures are compared to normal temperatures. And then you start checking them off one by one, line by line, left to right. I did it left to right this time instead of top to bottom because it fits on a page a little bit easier when you do it left to right than top to bottom when there's several pages. And then as in our typical format, Whichever line has the most check marks, that's what's wrong with that refrigeration system. So we could see that this one has either a flooding or overcharge system. So I would recover that refrigerant and verify the charge. Maybe I, maybe I can weigh it out, but maybe it's such a small charge that I weigh it out and then I weigh it back in just to verify. And if I have the same symptoms, then I'm going to replace my flooding expansion valve on this little Neo ice machine. So that was a chart, me and take credit for this, and Will too, Will really helped me with this one as well. Gotta give him credit as well uh, to pick up on all the mistakes that I made on it. But we verified this charge works really well uh, for temperature diagnostics on an ice machine. You know, I think we're gonna see more and more of that as we go in the future where you don't have just you know, you know, you don't have to put your gauges on to analyze a refrigeration problem. We're going to make you look at the temperatures first. And then if the temperatures don't seem right, you know, then we're going to have you verify it um, with some diagnostics. So this little Soto machine, again, this is a 50 hertz ice machine typically. Not sold in the United States, sold in Europe, uh, sold in the Far East might be sold in certain parts of South America or like some of the islands offshore and stuff like that. You know, I did have one once when I was working tech support, a guy called in and he's like, what is this Manitowoc ice machine? And it was, he was in Miami and I was like, oh yeah, that's a little Soto. And he's like, I've never seen one of these before. I'm like, yeah, cause they're 50 Hertz. But what had happened is it was like a big massive yacht that had come into port in Miami and you know their ice machine wasn't working so they just called the local miami service guy and you know this boat was running on 50 hertz boat it was a yacht running on 50 hertz so you know i had to get the information for it but it's out there this is an international webcast that i put on every month so here's some of the details of that soto board right and if you've never seen one like one of these it's kind of interesting to look at it um it's got um, some thermistors in that Soto ice machine and it's got some inputs that tell it what to do and then it's got our little relay outputs that tell it what to send power to on that ice machine. Real simple sequence of operation on that Soto ice machine. It has a 210 second fill cycle and it has a freeze cycle that the thermistor tells it when to go into harvest. Harvest time is automatically determined by a thermistor um, and then goes through a three minute delay for restart uh, when that ice machine goes off on full bin. R290 especially. 
So we have Soto 404 A ice machines, and then we have Soto R290 ice machines. Now, when we did the R290 ice machine in Soto, we made some changes uh, in this freeze cycle on that ice machine just because of the properties of R290. Um, so it has a red board on the Soto to make it stand out that this is an R290 control board that has a little bit of a change uh, in some of the times in there. One of the changes is the condenser fan motor in freeze typically shuts off during the last three minutes in the freeze cycle. Harvest time, water fill time, and during harvest due to the liquid temperature. So we can see we got a thermistor on that liquid line controlling that fan instead of a... Um, instead of a pressure switch control in the fan and then five minutes into the freeze cycle that control board calculates condenser fan motor time in the freeze and it typically shuts off towards the end so you can see that's a little bit different right there on that r290 just because of the properties of how r290 uh, makes ice just a little bit different to you know the high pressure for for a refrigerant that we're normally used to in those systems so here's a here's a soto spray cuba we call these filling up the water reservoir over the top of the ice cubes uh, and this is actually very similar to an sm50 ice machine that we do sell in the united states as well um that puts water over the top of the cubes and it falls through these little holes and fills up the trough down below uh, on that unit during a harvest cycle to assist the ice coming off so, of course, you can see we have a nice R290 sign on the front of that ice machine. Letting you know something's different with it. Um, and we're going to use temperature diagnostics again for that manual. Here's my sprays spraying up into those upside down uh, cubes or horizontal cube section. Again, spray cuba on this Soto ice machine for it. Um, filling up those cube cells with water and then eventually those are turned into ice on that ice machine. Troubleshooting for just refrigeration system alone. We're going to go with temperature probes again on this system, just like we did on the Neo. And we're going to put them on the inlet and outlet of the evaporator. So you can see where we've lighted that up for you on a Soto and here's a look at schematic of it where we're going to put those temperature probes so you can get a nice temperature reading of what's going on in this r290 refrigeration system uh in the freeze cycle and the harvest cycle so we can try and avoid putting gauges on there and analyzing a refrigeration problem with refrigerant pressures so we're going to try and do it with temperatures on there instead of refrigerant pressures uh, just, just so we can see what's going on there. Here's a thermostatic expansion valve system. Uh, we're going to put our probes on that one too. And it's going to go into a harvest cycle. And we can monitor those. And again, just like the Neo, we developed a temperature chart so that you could see what was going on. And you can see this one uh, has the most X's on the second line down. So that's going to give us a diagnosis of what's wrong with that ice machine all right so that was 290 now here's the one you might be more interested in if you're in the united states this is a crystal craft usp 0100a released in october this year so this got released in october this year and they're selling they're definitely selling right now um out there in the market this makes a real big cube um for kind of gourmet drinks uh, but it's selling in the market now, so if you're in the United States, this is the R290 system you might run into on that unit. USP refrigeration includes a cap tube expansion valve, R290 refrigeration fan cycling, low ambient compressor. So 290 cap tube fan cycling on that system. Um, when we get low production problems, one thing we notice is we like to check this thermostat that goes on the evaporator. Um, low ice production, higher energy consumption. Before troubleshooting the refrigeration station, make sure everything else is good. So today, I'm talking about diagnosing refrigeration systems, right? I'm not talking about leaky valves or dump valves not working or water inlet valves not working. I'm just talking refrigeration system in, with R290 on those. So we've got a temperature location 
diagram of where you'd put your temperature probes within four inches of the inlet and outlet of the compressor and the components on there. So I put one on the inlet of the evaporator, one on the outlet, one on the hot gas valve, one on the suction line, one on the discharge line on that ice machine. And then I can go through my chart on this Crystal Craft USP. Uh, there is a technician handbook out there already for it on the website. And I can look at what normal temperatures are in my book. And then I can go look at what my temperatures are on my chart. Are they lower than normal? Are they higher than normal? Uh, and I can go through and put check marks and then they can tell me what's wrong with the refrigeration system. So I can go left to right, ticking off this refrigeration system that's doing something wrong and it tells me what's wrong with that ice machine. So I got two on the top one, one on the second one, six on the third one, and four on the bottom one of that machine. Here's a here's a chart for this unit. Uh, and I did this one a little bit different, or Will and I did this a little bit different. As well as showing you the temperatures, we actually showed you the operating pressures right here too. So that was, a, that was a, I don't know if controversial is the right word for it, but that was a little bit different. You know, before, we didn't really show you what the refrigeration pressures of that R290 were of it running because you're supposed to analyze it by temperature. But then we were like, well, I think more information is better for them. You know, if they did change the compressor and they do still have ports on it, let's let them know what the pressures are supposed to be when it's running. Why not? Just let them know what those pressures are supposed to be. They can still analyze it with temperature. Um, but then let's just give them pressures too. To me, more information, giving them extra information is a good thing here in this scenario, okay? So refrigeration systems critically charged again. Does not have access ports. We're not allowed to put access ports on R290. Um, but I'm like, well, if he's if he's put his own access ports on it because he's got to pull out refrigerant or something like that, just going to let him know what the pressures are on that ice machine. So just to review, USP 0100 sold in the United States, 60 hertz version. So this is the R290 you would run into if you're working in the United States. R290 has an expansion valve in it, refrigeration tubing we looked at, we looked at refrigeration, oh, I'm sorry, we looked at temperature locations, and then we looked at the analysis chart that's in your tech book. Hang on, let me go back a second. We looked at the analysis chart that's in your tech book to get information. All right, so here is your test. <laughs> here is your test. So you can do this two ways. I think Will is going to put that link up in the chat box so you can click on the link. Um, you can take your phone right now. I know on Apple phones, all you have to do is put your camera on and hold it up to that QR code, and it will ask you if you want to go to the website to take the test. You don't have to take if you want to take the test i think on android phones you have to enable something for the qr code to be recognized on your camera i'm not sure i don't have an android phone to uh to look at that but you can go there right now in fact i'm gonna um i'm gonna use my phone and just make sure it's working yep and take me in there yep it takes me right in there and it'll take you into that quiz and you can complete that out. Uh, put your name in there. The results will come right in here to us and put the email. Make sure you make sure you get your email right. Don't you know, don't do a typo on it. Put the email that you want the certificate of completion for this course on and you'll get your results right away after you've done the course. And then uh, shortly after you will get emailed a certificate and this course contents that we looked at today as well. Webcast. Thanks for joining us. This is Jonathan Bailey at Manitowoc Ice from Manitowoc, Wisconsin. See you next time.